conference for all of us. Um, so I'd like to just go ahead and let our panelists introduce themselves and talk about their unique fundraising path. I pulled the short straw. All right. Um, thank you for that. Sorry, I'm I'm late. <laughs> I was just about to get a special microphone, but this this will do. Um, we're introducing ourselves and in, in our path for funding. Uh, okay, my name is Burke Toss. I'm the CEO of CENTR. And uh, I think the, our, our, our pathway to fundraising, I would say probably a scrappy pathway. Uh, probably a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to that. But I think specifically, uh, we've done a, a an interesting thing, a lot of European companies will come to the U.S. for funding. We actually got funding from a European fund um, because of a very strategic fit with one of the partners. They happen to be the creator of the industry that, that we're in. So it was a big nod, a big credibility uh, added to our company. So I think that's probably unique from our perspective, aside from a very scrappy <laughs> a raise. I guess you, do I get the call who goes next? <laughs> go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, that was great. I'm Karen Holtzberger, I'm the CEO of Spintech and I've been in the role 45 days, so when you talk about fundraising, I'm in the process right now. Um, so, you know, doing our Series A and, you know, having that journey with uh, investors coming in. I would say scrappy is a really good term. Um, you know, historically, Ours has been scrappy and probably a little bit lumpy when you're dealing with non-dilutive capital coming from the U.S. government through NIH grants, you know, which is a really great way and what our founder has done to really uh, identify form, fit, and function of a solution before taking it to market, before taking it to regulatory. So that's been a terrific journey for him and now my in-process journey of a Series A with um, investors and term sheets and raising capital here. So it's uh, been really exciting. Great. Uh, my name's uh, Joe McGinley. I'm the founder and CEO of McGinley Orthopedics. And uh, we're located in Casper, Wyoming, so none of you will forget that uh, after tonight. <laughs> um, you know, we've taken some uh, very, our, our products, first of all, we like to innovate in the orthopedic industry. And we've carried that over into how we raise funds, even how we sell our products. But on the fundraising side, uh, you know, we've raised over 23 million to date in our company, all with private investment, uh, no private equity, no venture funding uh, into our company. Uh, uh, we're going to see David Wheel talk tomorrow about the Jobs Act. I think we used every nuance of the Jobs Act to uh, fund our company uh, to date. Uh, we've raised funds using Regulation D, 506 uh, B and C. And uh, we're, you know, we're excited to announce that we're going to be transitioning, uh, hopefully, to a Reg A plus here uh, in a few months to do a growth round. Uh, you know, with a Reg A plus, we can raise up to 75 million per year. Uh, in a similar manner by private investment, private individuals, which allows us to continue to control management uh, of our company. So that's how we've done it to date. Hopefully we'll be successful with the Reg A Plus and continue uh, growth funding with our company. Great, uh, can you hear me? Switch, thank you. <laughs> Let's try again. Oh. All right, <laughs> let's start over. I'm Lee Sean Acklog. I'm the chairman and CEO and co-founder of PavMed, which is a public NASDAQ listed um, diversified medical technology company. And I'm also the subsidiary of its public subsidiary, uh, Lucid Diagnostics, which went public this last, um, this last fall. And I guess we're picking a single word to describe uh, uh, our, our path, because this is different paths. I would say probably contrarian, in that we've, uh, we've utilized entirely the public markets since we founded, um, nearly entirely, the, uh, this company in 2014 and went public in a very small IPO, not Reg A+, although, although David Wield was on our board for many years, um, but through a traditional uh, S1 front door NASDAQ IPO for both. And um, you know, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about the pros and cons of that, uh, but I'm a big believer um, in the flexibility um, that it provided us, even though we were pre-revenue, non-commercial for the first five years of that. So I'll leave it there. Um, so in preparation for this panel, we talked a little bit about how you know, different types of capital come with different strings. And so um, I'd like to ask each of you how you came to decide on the fundraising path that you chose. 
Maybe we'll start with. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so we chose the public markets because the pa the parent company, PubMed, is a bit unusual in that it's, 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 it was designed from day one to be diversified across all aspects of medical technology. We, we were really determined not to be pigeonholed and, and into any particular specialty and have the opportunity to um, incorporate technologies across the spectrum. What we didn't realize at the time was that it was going to extend beyond medical devices into diagnostics and now into digital health. And um, that's, that was a, that's not an easy story to tell traditional VC investors because they're looking for a very you know, clear story with a clear, you know, we're going from A to B to C to D. And um, uh, so we felt that it would provide us with the flexibility uh, to be able to pounce on opportunities that came our way. And that's actually how it's played out. It's also allowed us to build a diversified company with subsidiaries that are created through the through licensing technology, uh, and in, in a sense, almost you know, pretend to be a larger uh, diversified company. In that, even though we don't have cash flow at the parent to drive this diversification, it, we have enough access to capital at the parent that we can start subsidiaries, finance them from the parent. Uh, which can raise its own capital uh, un unencumbered um, you know, um, at the parent level. And then when the subsidiary reaches a point where it truly needs growth capital, it already has a story to tell. Uh, and that's how we, we, we did this with, the, um, with our diagnostic subsidiary, Lucid Diagnostics. Pass that one back to you. I guess this is the hot <laughs> mic for uh, tonight. Um, yeah, you know, we, we chose our path really out of need. and. Uh, you know, when we first started our company with innovative medical technologies, we had a lot of physicians that wanted to invest in our product and in our company. Um, and, and we had a very nice uh, stream of revenue coming in from investment uh, from the individuals. Uh, it worked well. We, can contain, uh, we could uh, continue to maintain management control. Uh, but then we had a lot of individuals that were involved that wanted to actually help grow the company and, and help become involved. Uh, so it worked really well for us. And then we figured out a way to include a larger number of our investors uh, and individuals, um, not necessarily in the day-to-day -day of the company, but if we had needs, uh, we had such a diverse group of investors, we can say, hey, we're, we're trying to do this. Anyone have expertise in this area? And sure enough, you'd get 10, 20 investors reach out and say, absolutely, we can make introductions. Uh, we can help uh, keep this going. Um, so you know, it worked, worked really well for us using individuals and having them as part of the team, part of the family as we grew the company. Now, you know, when you get to a certain point, that becomes a little bit challenging to manage and maintain that number of investors and still have that intimate uh, feel for the individuals. Um, but again, you know, we've tried to innovate that and uh, we've tried to keep them included in the process and help us keep going forward. We're not going to switch mics, right? No, I think we're okay. <laughs> um, I think for us, and especially with you know where SpinTech's roots are is in in science and uh, math and technology, that you can use you know academic research funding through the NIH to really you know understand clinical effectiveness, technical feasibility, and early insights to market acceptance. We became to at this inflection point and in why Series A funding was needed is to really think about now we're post-regulatory, but what is the go-to-market? What is the commercialization strategy? What is, you know, how do we start to really grow the business moving from research to clinical adoption within the health systems? And that was really one of the decision points of the, the angel investors and the board of really going out to seek capital. And that's, I think, an important decision point for founders, you know, really the innovators of when to make make that choice of seeking, you know, traditional investment from VC. And that's really where we are today. Um, I, I think that the pattern for startups on what path you choose, it depends a lot on the technology and the market that you're going after. And for us, uh, our technology, it's a holographic ablation guidance system. It's a wearable headset. You're, for the first time ever, the promise of using augmented reality in an actual procedure is now becoming a reality. But when this company was started four, five years ago, it's really difficult to convince. You heard the investors before us talk about these risks, right? And when Tuck was talking about all those risks, I'm like, 
there's zero chance we checked any of those boxes five years ago, right? So uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it matters a lot on what you're doing and what market you're going into. So I think uh, for me, um, it's really important to be self-aware of what you're doing and the limitations because it's really easy to chase the big stories. You know, a so-and-so company got 30 million from NEA, one of the most premier venture funds. Not every tech is developed like that, as you can see, right? So we started with NIH grants for this reason. It was an academic spin out, and we were able to convince the government to give us $2 million to start this thing as this is going to change how these procedures are completed for the better, for the patients, for a massive disease, AFib. 40 million patients have it today. And now fast forward, the next thing we had really seeked is an investor who understands the field better than anyone else. This is a tall ask. There's only like, you know, a dozen people in the world. Um, and for me, that was the strategy. How do we get people behind our technology and support us so we can actually build something that was not, not even imaginable a long time ago and then start to establish with clinical data our own standard so that we can start to actually build something from there. So it's a very different journey for everybody. I think the, the bottom line to me is that you really got to be aware of what you're going after and the limitations and just stay true to who you are. And I think that hopefully <laughs> provides some sort of comfort knowing that you don't have to do what everybody else does. <laughs> And Karen, maybe you can also speak to the pros and cons of government funding. So I'll start. Um, government funding, you know, it's slow. You you uh, you know put in your grant request. You know you put your you know your papers in and all of that, and then you wait. And so we're in the middle of uh, doing a grant uh, grant request right now with the NIH around a commercialization of our next product, around cerebral microbleeds, and. We submitted and we won't hear until December. And the money also, this is a funny word, drips in. And so it drips in monthly or quarterly. And so it's really hard to predict and really put growth plans into place when funding sources come in in that way, in you know lumpy ways, scrappy ways, unpredictable on timing and all of that. And so I think you've gotta be really specific of how you're gonna use those funds um, is it early commercialization to get to regulatory? Is it around, you know, proving out a proof of concept from research around the, the device that you're building? And then really think, how do you start to s shift and then, you know, shift into a higher gear around the commercialization efforts of that? And I think that's a, a really interesting way to have to think about how do those funds come in, um, when they come in, and how they're used over time. I won't regurgitate the things you said because I think they're absolutely spot on. That's nice. <laughs> you, you talk like someone who's been through it. Yeah, like 45 um, so you consume the information. That's, that's very good. Um, I think uh, the, the things I would add to it is grant writing is an art. And you really need to know how the whole process works so that when you're stuck in this drip by drip mode, you're actually making progress. Um, so it's a bit of a challenge. Academics do a great job with this because they live this life, right? They run their labs with grants. Um, our co-founders happen to be grant reviewers themselves working for the government. So um, it, it's, a, it's a volunteer position and you get selected based on your credentials. So it's, uh, it was a unique situation for us, but um, obviously the big pro is it's non-dilutive. and NIH or um, NHLBI or, or whichever institute you're working with, they'll, they are able to take different risks than any early stage VC can take. It's a very different organization in that way. So those are pros. If you're, if you're trying to do something that can impact our field in a massive way and really there's no corollary and it's really difficult to 
account for it and put together a nice investment committee review for you know, a VC to, to get you the funding. I think it's a great utility, but if you don't know what you're doing in grants, you better get help and write a good grant so that you can use those funds to actually build the company. Because there's so many technologies that get a grant and they can't build the company beyond the grant itself and deliver something, but it doesn't go anywhere from there. So um, that's the con part of it. Um, so I'd love to be able to give all the CEOs who are watching some you know, practical advice. And so if there was one thing or one hire that each of you made to help you, you know, close your fundraising, um, what would it be? If you're going the path we took, which is to um, utilize the public markets, it's, that's an easy question. You have to have a um, very experienced CFO. <laughs> you know, so we have uh, Dennis McGrath, who's uh, we were just fortunate enough to to um, to, to uh, bring in uh, about a year, less than a year after we went public and um, 20 years in the public markets, both as a CFO and a, C and a CEO. And the, you know, it's just a whole ecosystem. All of, the, all of the SEC filings, all of the public audit accounting, um, the access and Rolodex as it relates to investors, public, public investors, bankers, moving up the ecosystem, all of the things that you have to do um, uh, as a, as a microcap um, public company all center around that, so that's that's quite easy. Yeah, for our company as well, it was our uh, CFO. So, uh, you know, our, here's another great Wyoming story for you. Uh, <laughs> we met our CFO uh, in Wyoming. Uh, I was being recognized. Our company is being recognized by our governor in the state of the state address as an innovative startup company in Wyoming. And sitting next to me was the current president of the University of Wyoming. Um, we had never met each other. Uh, after the event, uh, we went out to lunch and, and were chatting a bit. And I come to find out he, his history was in venture capital back uh, on the East Coast for most of his life. He came out to Wyoming, uh, became involved with the Wyoming Business Council, was teaching classes at the university, uh, ended up becoming the university president, and was ending his term. Um, so we were looking for a CFO at the time, and I said, listen, we're a small startup, don't take this as an insult, but would you like to be our CFO? <laughs> um, you know, he, he's like, I thought you'd never ask. And, uh, uh, you know, he ended up joining our team, and just that respect and credibility that he brought to our team and his experience in venture capital helped immensely. It helped guide me, helped uh, guide our company, and helped have those conversations where, you know, I, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And he provided that background and knowledge, and, and we worked very well as a team uh, raising funds and, and having the investor conversation. So for us, by far, uh, you know, our CFO coming on board uh, has been our biggest asset for raising funds. I'm going to say CFO also. Um, is I, we're like the trifecta right here. Are you going to say the same thing? Okay, good. <laughs> I was in the job 24 hours, and I'm looking at term sheets and starting to negotiate and trying to understand the cap table and all the finances and all the information that comes with capital investment. And I said, who can I call? And so I ended up a consultant CFO that I'd worked with, because I sat on the other side of it. I was acquiring companies from the corporate side, you know, working for GE and then uh, a company that was just acquired by Microsoft. And I said, who did I work the best with on the other side of the table? And I called him up the next day. I'm like, I haven't talked to you in three years. Will you come on board? And he said, absolutely. And so having a, a trusted advisor who's been on the side of the table, who understands capital raises, who understands um, founders who don't necessarily understand what dilutive capital means to them to help guide that way and be really just a source for me has been incredible this past month. So you don't have a CFO? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are you rethinking that strategy? <laughs> I, I was sitting here, I'm like, man, maybe that's what I got to do next. Um, no, but, but I think the, the theme is you need to understand the, the particular capital strategy you have and not just like have a, um, 
like a casual understanding of it. You need to know it in and out and what's going to come down the road. So each one of these raises, like the, the first uh, Lishan and, and, and Joe talking about technicalities, right? Like, I don't know anything about what you have to do for SEC. But the difference was, <laughs> right? So, so it's a complicated thing. It's technicalities and, and it's an it's a, it's a existential risk. So like for any startup, and certainly this is, I'll speak from my point of view, I always feel like I'm managing existential risks as opposed to what's a nice to have, you know, wouldn't this be nice? And yeah, a CFO would be great. Um, but when, again, you're trying to exist, mm -hmm. I think uh, really understanding whatever your strategy is. So from our perspective, I've come from other startups. You know, this is the fourth one I'm involved with. Been through a, a, a listing in NASDAQ. We got acquired. So um, I had a, a, a decent command of what, what is it, like what is in the terms, what are the expectations, what is a reasonable thing to push back on, and what should you expect, and how do you even set those expectations. Um, but I would say the one thing that, that I would going back to your question, um, highlight is the power of continuous networking and interacting with the VCs, investors, angel communities, um, individuals, because everyone that's invested in Centiar as a VC has said no at some point. And I can tell you that with uh, total honesty. And we come back to them and we said, we did these three things that you were worried about. And, and that is a huge game changer when you go back to somebody and say, hey, you told me this. I actually took care of that. Now let's go, <laughs> right? Um, and I even have a, another anecdote just briefly to share. Someone emailed to our info at centiar.com and said, I like to invest. And obviously, I assume it's a scam, <laughs> right? <laughs> like 99% of the time, it is indeed a scam. But as a CEO, I have to follow up. That's my job, right? I don't have a CFO, so I can't delegate it to anyone. This is what I do, um, you know, a, a big part of my job. So, so I followed up, assuming it was going to be a scam. And I have a rule for stuff like this. I'm like, if I can't have a video chat, I'm not even going to, you know, engage. So long story short, he put in a significant amount from his own pocket. Like he became one of the you know, decent holders on our cap table, and he's been absolutely remarkable. And it's just, it's just a, a wild um, ride sometimes, and that's why I say scrappy, mm -hmm. because uh, we believe in what we do. I feel like we've traveled to the future, and we've lived it, and we're coming back and trying to bring people along, right? And, and um, you never know. You never know who's, who you're going to convince at what point. So my biggest advice will be take that meeting. Don't discount based on some preconceived notion. I always say this. Your job is to get to a yes with them. You can decide what you do after that. Just get the yes first. Just don't not take the meeting. Take all the meetings. And then you'll learn, if nothing. Um, so I'd like to thank all our panelists, and but I'd like to leave some time if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask. Sleepy time, drink, <laughs> drinky time. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that was an incredible anecdote story. Could you say it again? Yes, yeah, sorry. Side conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, ours are pretty straightforward. You get a no, you get a Nobel list, for, and they tell you, you know, the three thousand people that have invested. And when I get an info at PadMed.com, it's usually a pissed off investor who said, "Why did the stock go down yesterday?" <laughs> that's the that's the con of a of a of a proper SEC listing. 
yeah, I, I mean, our cap table is pretty straightforward, and you know, we have audited financials and everything else. So um, it, it's not that complicated. If you have good finance managers, uh, good accountants, um, you know, they're they're gonna. This is what they do. They they keep all that in order for you. Uh, and then it, it is really key to have the audited financials just to make sure everything's in check and make sure that your accounting's correct uh, along the way. Um, we also just again on a side get those emails from time to time. I've got to say more than 50% actually have invested really? as they've come in. Uh, I follow up on all of them. I usually will take those personally because they are interesting sometimes. So, well, I'm going to have to watch for this. Yeah. <laughs> and again, our cap table too is uh, very very straightforward. Um, and I've spent a bunch of time not just understanding who's investing, why they've invested because we've had a number of angel investors in, you know, to get us to this point. And if you want them to come back, you need to really make sure that you continue, to, that they're really with your strategy, understand where they're going and understanding that future. And that's a, a relationship over the, you know, since I started to make sure that I understood those other 10 that were doing small investments that got us from point A to point B. Um. <laughs> Probably not a surprise, but I manage our own cap table. We use Carta, yeah. one of the equity mm -hmm. management tools. Um, and that's for all the different startups I've been with. It's life changing because I, I think we've saved, I don't know, half a million on lawyer fees probably <laughs> with all the different uh, issuances. So our cap table is, is also pretty straightforward. We have some preferred shareholders. There's about. 15 investors and another 15 employees, roughly. Um, and there's a couple uh, ex-employees who actually exercised their stock options. Pretty straightforward. I think, um, I, I'm wondering where, what prompted that question because I was trying to think like, what happens in a cap table that you would consider creative? Yeah, uh, again, so you remembered we're from Wyoming, which is great. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's really not, it, we really haven't seen any complication in it. Yeah, you know, uh, I'd say of our investors, maybe 25, 30% are from Wyoming, rest are, you know, around the country. Um, you know, we've, we've had various rounds. Uh, we're, we're still listed as a, an LLC. We're going to be transitioning to a C Corp. Um, you know, we, we've had, we've paid shares for services, things like that, but it, it's all very straightforward and accounted for investor communication so um, yeah I'm not I'm not quite sure where the the complication is I, I think if you manage it correctly and manage expectations and make sure that you communicate well um, we haven't really seen much complication uh, in it at all yeah, we also use Carta and that's been you know a really great asset tool for us too maybe kind of I could add, add one thing as it relates to um, the question from the last session about Reg A plus and and for those companies that are looking to transition to uh, the public markets, it is really important to understand the, the complex there. It is actually, I was sort of kidding aside, there is a lot of complexity, particularly around retail investors versus institutional investors. If you're a pre-revenue company, you're gonna likely get, you know, start off with, uh, with a high percentage of retail investors. And, you know, one of the things about these alternative paths like Reg A Plus is that, sure, you can go raise money and you can be successful at doing so, and there are a lot of complexities, but every time you raise money as a public company, the, you know, how it performs in the aftermarket is really key. If you're raising VC money, then you can wait till the next letter in the alphabet and you, and, and you try to do well between that, between now and then. But if you're raising money in the public markets, um, you know, what the, you know, the liquidity, the opportunities, you know, the expectations that there's liquidity uh, immediately. And um, for example, people have who have used reverse mergers um, into a shell, where there's a shell public company out there that's sort of done all the infrastructure work, uh, you know, that can get hairy because that, there's often hundreds of investors um, who are unknown. Uh, who can who can come and, and, and be a be a be, be a bit of a pain later? So, um, you know, transitioning to to a public um, to the public markets, you know, there are a lot of pitfalls that have to be um, you know, watched out for. I was going to add, and I know people want to leave. I, I get it, um, but now that you asked the question and clarified, 
I feel like uh, perhaps what you were getting at, maybe not the cap table complexity, but the shareholder relationship complexities. And certainly, um, we have a couple of those uh, because we have a few individuals who got enamored with the technology early on and we took their money. Um, they became shareholders. And uh, they really don't understand how financing works. So somebody asked me, they said, hey, you guys had raised, I can't remember exactly the question, but you guys raised a million dollars, I put in 100 grand, I own that percentage, right? I'm like, well, no, because we were valued at a, you know, there's a valuation. Um, but it's very wild to me that who has 100 grand, grand laying around and doesn't really understand? <laughs> so it turns out it happens. So we have a little bit of that where it takes some time to educate and manage and obviously I can't tell them bugger off right like I have to actually relate and they put in money and we desperately needed it at the time so there's certainly that complexity and everyone will tell you right avoid all those scenarios that's great if you can yes but if you can't survive and build your company and then change the world <laughs> Well, I just want to thank the panelists one more time for thank you. staying up here late. Thank you. Okay, thank you.